This is a homily for the third Sunday of Easter. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 24, verses 35 to 48. None of us can avoid death, no matter how rich, healthy, holy, intelligent, talented, successful or famous we are, death will come to us as it comes to everyone who has ever lived. The greatest rulers on earth, the wealthiest entrepreneurs, the most famous superstars have no advantage over the poorest of people. Death is the great leveller. But what happens after we die? When Christianity burst onto the scene two millennia ago, what did the pagan world at that time believe about life after death? Well, here are a few examples. There is a scene in Homer's Iliad in which Priam, the king of Troy, kneels before Achilles, who has killed Priam's son, Hector. The grief-stricken Priam begs for the body of his son so that he can give him a proper funeral. Achilles says to Priam, You must endure and not be broken-hearted. Lamenting for your son will do no good at all. You will be dead yourself before you bring him back to life. In other words, there is no resurrection of the body. The dead stay dead. The Greek playwright Asiclus is often described as the father of tragedy. In his play Eumenides, Asiclus puts these words into the mouth of Apollo, who was speaking at the foundation of the Athenian high court, the Areopagus. Once a man has died and the dust has soaked up his blood, there is no resurrection. The Greek philosopher Plato spoke of the body as if it were the prison of the soul. He saw the soul as a more or less independent and superior entity to the body. New Testament scholar Tom Wright says this of Plato. For Plato, the soul is the non-material aspect of a human being and is the aspect that really matters. Bodily life is full of delusion and danger. The soul is to be cultivated in the present, both for its own sake and because its future happiness will depend upon such cultivation. The soul, being immortal, existed before the body and will continue to exist after the body is gone. That same understanding of the body is reflected in Cicero's De Republica. In the epilogue of that work, Scipio Aemilianus, a Roman general and statesman who lived in the 2nd century BC, has a dream. In the dream, he meets his famous father and grandfather. His grandfather tells him that all those who have been good statesmen will go to heaven which is, after all, where they came from in the first place. Scipio then asks the old man if he and the rest of them are really still alive. His grandfather replies, Yes, they are, and freed from their chains, from that prison house, the body. For what you call life is in fact death. Cicero is quite clear and completely in the mainstream of Greco-Roman thought. The body is a prison house, a necessary one for the moment. Nobody in their right mind, having got rid of it, would want it or something like it back again. Resurrection of the body was not an option. For the Stoic philosopher Epictetus, who was born about 50 AD, a human being is a very little soul carrying around a corpse. Tom Wright offers this overview. 
we cannot stress too strongly that from Homer onwards, the language of resurrection was not used to denote life after death. The great majority of the ancients believed in life after death, but other than within Judaism and Christianity, they did not believe in resurrection. Resurrection denoted a new embodied life. It was not a disembodied heavenly life. All four of the Gospels emphasise the fact that the tomb where the body of Jesus was laid was empty on Easter Sunday morning. In today's Gospel, we have Luke's account of the risen Lord appearing to the disciples. Luke doesn't tell us who was present on this occasion, but presumably it's a large group of disciples, men and women. They are terrified and startled. The disciples are wondering if this is an hallucination, a phantom or a ghost. But the Lord assures them, Look at my hands and feet. Yes, it is I. Touch me and see for yourselves. A ghost has no flesh and bones, as you can see I have. The risen Lord is the same person whom they knew before. And then he asks them, Have you anything here to eat? Although the body of the risen Lord could appear and disappear at will, it was still a physical body, able to eat baked fish. Jesus is not a disembodied spirit, He has a real body of flesh, bones and blood. Christianity, therefore, is founded on an event with a unique promise. Jesus defeated death by dying and rising again, physically rising from the dead. This one man brought back with him from the realm of the dead the hope and the certainty of eternal life for all. But how do Christians envisage eternal life? Other religions believe in life after death. Some hold that our souls continue after death. Some teach reincarnation, an endless cycle of birth and death. Christianity teaches bodily resurrection. This wonderful, unique, earthly life purified of all its slag, of all its inadequacies, is to be lifted up to the plane of the eternal. Let's now turn to today's Gospel. Two disciples, Cleopas and his companion, most likely his wife, encountered the risen Lord as they were returning home to Emmaus from Jerusalem. They rush back to Jerusalem to tell the other disciples about their experience when suddenly the risen Lord appears in their midst. Luke's account of the risen Lord's appearance, firstly to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus and then to the disciples in Jerusalem, is an example of one of the inescapable rhythms of human life. The rhythm that I speak of begins with enchantment, which is followed by disenchantment, which in turn is followed by re-enchantment. Consider this example. I'm attracted to another person and a promising relationship begins, but it's not long before disenchantment rears its head. The more intimately that I come to know the other person, the more aware I am of the things about them that annoy or irritate me. At this stage, I may decide to end the relationship, or I could admit that neither of us is perfect, and we take each other for better and for worse. That is re-enchantment. I join a new parish, and everything seems to be wonderful. Parishioners have been so welcoming, and I love the church building. Life couldn't be better. This is all that I could ever hope for in a parish. But it's not long before I become disillusioned. 
The parish priest's homilies are long and boring. I don't like the hymns being sung. And the people aren't as friendly as they were when I first arrived in the parish. Maybe I should look around for another parish. Or I could remain here. And why? Listen to this reflection by the late Bishop Geoffrey Robinson. There has never been a perfect church, and there never will be. I must always work within an imperfect church, and must never forget that I am myself an imperfect member of that imperfect church, contributing my problems and failures as well as my assistance. Once I acknowledge this, I have reached the point of re enchantment. This rhythm of enchantment, disenchantment, and re enchantment is a lesson that the Hopi people of North America teach their young people as part of their initiation ceremonies. Hopi territory once covered what are now the American states of Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico. The current Hopi reservation is now situated in the northeast of Arizona. Sam Gill is the author of a number of books on Native American religious traditions, including Native American Religions, An Introduction. Gill writes about the role of what are called kachinas in Hopi society. The kachinas are the ancestral spirits of the Hopi people, and in Hopi rituals they are represented by costumes like the ones you can see here. In particular, they wear rather distinctive masks, just like the ones that you can see displayed here. Gill tells us that prior to the age of initiation, the children are very carefully protected from seeing Kachina figures without their masks or seeing the masks when not being worn. In other words, young Hopi children actually believe that the Kachinas they see in their religious rituals really are the ancestral spirits of their people. The initiation rites that Gill describes take place in an underground ceremonial chamber that is known as a kiva. The children celebrating their initiation rites are gathered together in the kiva, and the kuchinas come to visit them, entertaining them with numerous kachina dances, and they tell children secret stories about the origin of the kachinas. The children are enthralled by their encounter with the ancestral spirits of their people. On the final night of the initiation ceremonies, the children are again gathered in the kiva, filled with excitement as they await the arrival of the kachinas for their final visit. They can hear the kachinas as they approach the kiva, but then something happens that startles the children. They see the kachinas climb down the ladder into the kiva, but, to the children's amazement, the kachinas enter without masks, and for the first time in their lives, the initiates discover that the kachinas are actually members of their own village, impersonating the gods. This is a highly structured and deliberate experience of disenchantment. One young Hopi girl describes the effect it had upon her. I cried and cried into my sheepskin that night, feeling I had been made a fool of. How could I ever watch the Kachinas dance again? I hated my parents and thought I could never believe the old folks again. I know now it was best and the only way to teach the children, but it took me a long time to know that. When the masks of the Kachinas are removed, the children undergo a death experience. The secure world they once knew is shattered, and certitude 
dissolves into doubt. But the children are being taught an important lesson. Look beyond appearances. This lesson is expressed well by the 14th century theologian Meister Eckhart. Do not cling to the symbols, but get to the inner truth. In other words, symbols are like signs. We don't erect signs so that we can stop and admire them. We erect them to point us in the right direction. If we identify the sacred, the divine, the transcendent with the symbols that point towards them, we will inevitably become disillusioned. By way of example, how many Catholics have been disillusioned in their faith by the scandal of clerical abuse? If your faith depends upon having a perfect and sinless clergy, you are bound to be disenchanted. Disenchantment is a summons to venture more deeply into the mystery that lies at the heart of all reality. Luke's account of the risen Lord's appearance to the disciples is also a story of enchantment, disenchantment and re-enchantment. Keep in mind that the Lord appears in today's Gospel while the two disciples who had encountered the Lord on the road to Emmaus were telling their story to the other disciples. Following the crucifixion of Jesus, these two disciples were returning home to Emmaus when a stranger joins them. They would have assumed that he too was a pilgrim returning home after celebrating the feast of Passover in Jerusalem. We, of course, know that this stranger is Jesus himself, but neither of the disciples recognizes him. He asks, What are you discussing as you walk along? Cleopas replies, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know what has been happening there these last few days? The irony is, of course, that Jesus is the only one who truly does know what has just happened in Jerusalem. Cleopas then says, We had hoped that he was the one to set Israel free. This is the stage of enchantment. And we find other examples of this enchantment elsewhere in the Gospels. Consider, for example, John's account of the feeding of thousands of people from five loaves and two fish. The people are amazed. They see the sign but they fail to see where the sign is pointing. They're obviously thinking that if Jesus can feed a huge multitude from a few loaves and fish, then he's just the Messiah, the King, that we need to get rid of the Romans and make us a sovereign nation, no longer under the rule of foreign oppressors. But John tells us that Jesus could see that they were about to come and take him by force, and make him king. So he went back to the mountain by himself. Mark's Gospel tells us that during the journey to Jerusalem for the celebration of Passover, Jesus tells his disciples what awaits him. He will be handed over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit at him, and scourge him and put him to death and after three days he will rise again. But on each of these three occasions, the disciples fail to understand what he is saying. They instead are arguing among themselves about which of them is the greatest. On the third occasion, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, approach him saying, Allow us to sit one at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. When Jesus enters Jerusalem, the people acclaim him, Hosanna! Blessed is he who is coming in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Despite the fact that he comes riding on a donkey, the people are hoping that as Messiah, Jesus will restore the fortunes of Israel. But 
on Friday of that week, Jesus is crucified. For the disciples, this is disenchantment. This is not how they expected things to turn out. Tom Wright offers this reflection. The cross had a symbolic meaning throughout the Roman world. It meant, we Romans run this place, and if you get in our way, we'll obliterate you and do it pretty nastily too. Crucifixion meant that the kingdom hadn't come, not that it had. Crucifixion of a would-be Messiah meant that he wasn't the Messiah, not that he was. When Jesus was crucified, every single disciple knew what it meant. We backed the wrong horse. The game is over. Let's return to the two disenchanted disciples returning home to Emmaus. The mysterious stranger who had joined them, whom they still don't recognise, begins to lead them from disenchantment to re-enchantment. How foolish you are! So slow to believe all that the prophet said. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer and so enter into his glory? Luke then tells us, Then starting from Moses and from all the prophets, he explained to them the passages about himself throughout the scriptures. The process of re-enchantment reaches its climax once they reach Emmaus. Cleopas and his companion invite the stranger to join them. And as they sit at table, Jesus takes bread, breaks it, and hands it to them. And their eyes are opened. In those few words, we have one of the keys to re-enchantment. Their eyes are opened. They had become disenchanted because they were looking for the wrong kind of Messiah. In their book entitled The Invisible Gorilla, Christopher Shabris and Daniel Simons discuss what they call inattentional blindness. Inattentional blindness means that there is nothing wrong with our eyesight. We can see perfectly well But when we devote our attention to one thing in particular, we tend not to notice whatever might be contrary to our expectations. This phenomenon is illustrated in a short video clip that you can find easily on YouTube. There are eight people, a team of four who are wearing white tops and the other team of four wearing black tops. Each team has its own basketball, and they will begin passing the ball among themselves, white to white and black to black. The aim of the exercise is to count the number of passes that members of the white team make to each other. Ignore members of the team wearing black. Just concentrate on members of the team wearing white. Now, while this frantic passing of the ball from one player to another is in progress, a person wearing a gorilla suit walks through the midst of the players. Most people count the correct number of passes the team in white makes, but half of the people watching this exercise fail to see the gorilla. The authors conclude, amazingly, Roughly half of the subjects in our study did not notice the gorilla. The experiment has been repeated many times under different conditions with diverse audiences and in multiple countries, but the results are always the same. About half the people fail to see the gorilla. They call this phenomenon inattentional blindness. We see what we are expecting to see and tend not to notice whatever might be contrary to our expectations. Here's another example of inattentional blindness. 
Bunnings Warehouse is a chain of hardware stores. One particular branch had to employ security guards because the volume of shoplifting had increased. More worrying, it appeared as though the culprits might be staff members. So the security guards were told to keep a close eye on staff members as they left work each day. When a guard saw a staff member making his way to his ute with a rather large cardboard box, he became suspicious. When the staff member was asked what was in the box, he replied, wood chips. He went on to explain that he worked in the timber department and his boss had given the OK for him to take any chips. He used them for firewood. The guard thought to himself, this guy must think I'm stupid. He's obviously hiding stolen goods in the box. So he asked the staff member to empty the cardboard box. But, just as the staff member had said, there were only wood chips in the box. But the following day, the security guard saw the same staff member making his way to his ute with yet another cardboard box. The security guard thought to himself, this guy thinks because I didn't find anything in the box yesterday except wood chips that I'll just wave him through today. I'll bet that today the box is filled with stolen merchandise. So again, the staff member was asked to empty the box and once again it contained only wood chips. This went on for a whole week, and each time the security guard thought he would catch the staff member red-handed, but every time there were only wood chips. The store manager called the security guard and said to him, I don't understand how we're still having merchandise stolen, despite all the security guards. The security guard was also puzzled and sought more information. He asked what items of merchandise had been stolen. And the manager informed him, This week, seven wheelbarrows. Here we have a perfect example of inattentional blindness. We so often fail to see what is right before our very eyes because we're expecting to see something different. The disciples were expecting a Messiah who would restore the fortunes of Israel, a Messiah who would reward them with positions of honour, not a Messiah who would be executed on a cross. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus explained to Cleopas and his companion the passages about himself throughout the scriptures. And in today's gospel, Jesus opens the minds of the disciples to understand the scriptures. He says to them, So you see how it is written that the Christ would suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that in his name repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to this. New Testament scholar Richard Hayes makes this observation. Jesus and his first followers were Jews, whose symbolic world was shaped by Israel's scripture. Their categories for interpreting the world and their hopes for God's saving action were fundamentally conditioned by the biblical stories of God's dealings with the people of Israel. Therefore, it is not surprising that as the earliest Christian communities began to tell and retell stories about Jesus, they interpreted his life, death and resurrection in relation to those biblical stories. That is, the texts that Christians later came to call the Old Testament. So three important points. Firstly, the symbolic world of the earliest Christians was shaped by Israel's scripture. 
Secondly, the categories they used to interpret the world and their hopes for God's saving action were fundamentally conditioned by the biblical stories of God's dealings with the people of Israel. Thirdly, as the earliest Christian communities began to tell and retell stories about Jesus, they interpreted his life, death and resurrection in relation to those biblical stories, the texts that Christians later came to call the Old Testament. This is exactly what Jesus does for Cleopas and his companion, and for the disciples in Jerusalem in today's Gospel. He dispels their inattentional blindness and enables them to see in the Scriptures what they had previously overlooked, that he is the long-awaited Messiah, the innocent sufferer portrayed in the prophetic tradition. And so they are now to understand the Scriptures in a whole new way, in the light of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Hayes continues, The authors of the four canonical Gospels were the heirs of this tradition of storytelling, and they shared the early Christian community's passionate concern, a concern that, as far as we can tell, goes back to Jesus himself, to show that Jesus' teachings and actions, as well as his violent death an ultimate vindication constituted the continuation and climax of the ancient biblical story. Stuart Jackman's novel, The Davidson Affair, invites us to imagine how modern media might have covered the execution of Jesus, Jesus' son of David, hence the name Davidson. Suspend your disbelief as you travel back in time to first century Jerusalem. Cass Tennell is a reporter with the Rome-based Imperial Television Corporation and has been assigned to cover the execution of Jesus. Tennell's report includes an interview with Cleopas. He asks Cleopas whether or not He's a little afraid to tell his story, given that the authorities are taking a very serious view of the situation following reports that the tomb where the body of Jesus was laid is now empty. Cleopas replies, Well, yes, in a way, I suppose I am. I mean, I've never been one for sticking my neck out before. Kept in the background sort of thing. Only now, well... It doesn't matter anymore. You see, the worst they can do is to kill me. And death isn't the end. It's only the beginning. Up to yesterday morning, we only had half a life. People like you and me. Half alive. That's all we were. But now, now it's different. He's alive again. And because he's alive we're alive too, really alive for the very first time. You know something, Mr. Tennell? It's like being born again. That's what it is, being born again.